Bug Fables The Everlasting Sapling came out in November of 2019 and was hyped as a tribute to the first two Paper Mario games, Paper Mario and Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. But to many people's surprise, myself included, the game went above and beyond the Paper Mario formula. A Bug Fables doesn't just replicate the classic RPG battle system in papery visual style, but creates its own detailed world of diverse characters accompanied by a deep and fairly unique lore. The plot stands out as well, and some of the game's writing really knocks it out of the park. You know how in some games with a long and complex plot, it's a bit of a chore to take on the main story arc? Well, I'm happy to say that Bug Fables is not that sort of game, and in this video, I'm going to point out a few reasons why. We'll talk about aspects of formal writing techniques, as well as some bits of good game design. And by the end, hopefully, you'll see why the story of Bug Fables is just so freaking good. Well, let's get to it. The first thing that Bug Fables gets right is a solid, satisfying plot. We start off with the simple trope of collecting artifacts and hope they'll lead to the legendary Everlasting Sapling, which is sought after by Queen Eliza II and her mother before her. The search quickly widens in scope, becoming a kingdom-wide conflict filled with many compelling characters and overlapping story arcs. We've got a good formula here. Unlikable characters go on a simple quest and become involved in a larger adventure, the stakes of which are ever increasing. It's a formula used in all sorts of adventure games, and really originates in works of literary fiction. Though it is an effective plot structure, it does have the danger of becoming sprawling and confusing by the end of the game. Thankfully, the game paces itself excellently and I never once felt overwhelmed or confused by the detailed story and its ever-growing cast of characters. The chapter system helps with this, dividing things up nicely by the rise and fall of action in the different character arcs. Each chapter has a nice setup and conclusion, and they all blend together into a seamless story. One thing the game excels at is foreshadowing future events. Foreshadowing as a formal literary technique is when the author or writer leaves hints or clues to suggest that future events. It's essential in a story for building tension and making a twist feel satisfying. And I find that a lot of video games, especially older video games, don't always do a great job of this. Bug Fables never just pulls plot points out of thin air, they always have a good setup, a good hint that's to come. It might be a bit of dialogue, a strong visual, or even a piece of music that hints at something and leaves the player curious about what's coming next. One of the best examples of this is the build-up to our encounter with the goddess Venus. First off, we're only in chapter 2 at this point. Heck, I'm still getting all the battle action commands wrong, and we're going to meet a goddess? When you talk to people in the Golden Settlement, most folks say things like, Hell yeah, praise Venus, she's great. Okay, that makes us feel a little bit better. But then there are these ambiguous, faceless statues, which honestly kind of creep me out. And when we conclude the festival, Venus herself lets us into her domain? How does she do that? Can she just control anything she wishes to in the entire world? At this point, I was starting to feel pretty uneasy about this upcoming encounter. Also, her name is Venus, and she's a plant, and we're bugs. The music plays such a great role here, too. The festive mood of the Golden Settlement conveys the generosity and bounty that Venus provides to her people, but it's followed by the eerie and sonorous Golden Hills theme, which makes us pause and consider, is Venus really a force for good, or are we walking into a trap here? The plot structure of this chapter is beyond simple, and yet the story it tells is highly compelling. The mystery of Venus is foreshadowed perfectly, and the payoff for meeting her is, well, it's a boss battle for sure, but one we weren't certain of, one that took us by surprise, but also we kind of saw coming. Another example of foreshadowing is how Queen Eliza II's backstory is revealed. We know from the very beginning that something is up with the current queen. 
Her aggressive policies, Leif's distrust of her, and even the music in the palace suggest that maybe it's not the best idea for this queen to get her way. find out her true motives, it's the last thing we would have expected. Aware of her own flaws, she wishes to restore the youth and rule of her mother, the first queen, and remove herself from power. This motivation is unexpectedly touching and personal, and I think it elevates Eliza II to the same level of complexity of our main characters. And later on, she even helps us in battle. The twist on Eliza's cruel personality is unexpected and kind of shocking, but not completely out of the blue. The writers foreshadowed something sinister and secretive about the Queen from early on in the game, and what we find out about her both delivers on and defies our expectations. Another thing this game gets right is character development. We have characters that continuously develop and grow, and not always in ways that are obvious. Now this idea clearly stems from Paper Mario, though it's developed much further here. I mean, let's be real, after finishing a chapter in Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door, how much more does your partner's backstory develop? Vivian maybe defies this trope with development that spans several of the game's chapters, but the general trend is that once a character has quote-unquote finished their arc, they're practically forgotten in the story. Now, Bug Fables doesn't completely defy this idea, but goes for what I call a tiered approach instead. You have your typical one-arc characters who play a major role or two, maybe undergo a single change in values of personality, and then stay that way. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have your typical townsfolk, baddies, and other NPCs who pretty much stay constant throughout the game. And these characters with their charmingly repetitious dialogue and predictable personalities ground the story and give the player something constant to expect throughout the game. And then there are the dynamic characters with secondary facets to their personalities, multiple flaws to explore, and complex emotions to process. The game keeps these just a handful which includes the main characters, of course. And this is smart, because such characters demand a lot of screen time and end up giving us tons of dialogue. And don't get me wrong, I love games like The Witcher and Skyrim, with their huge cast of complex characters and long story arcs. But jeez, just look at these notes and bios you have to read through. The consequence of having a lot of complex characters is a lot of information. Oh my god, imagine having something like this to describe the characters in Bug Fables. This handful of dynamic characters undergo many changes throughout the game in arcs that span multiple chapters. They are almost always well-balanced and well-paced, and fairly unique from character to character. Leaf story arcs are hands down the most compelling, though. This bug is searching for answers regarding their past life, struggling to accept the current era they're living in, learning to control and hone their magical abilities, learning to be more empathetic, and coming to terms with the unfortunate truth about themselves and what creature they really are. And the best part is that at the game's end, none of these feel like they're neatly wrapped up or entirely finished, like there's more to come. The writers do a great job at showing us how these characters have made progress, giving us a sense of closure as players, but the writers also remind us that these characters are real people who are still developing and learning, still working to overcome injuries of the past. This is remarkably mature writing for a game which at first glance seems like it will be nothing but fluff and papery bugs. It reminds me a lot of the writing from Earthbound and Mother 3, which looks goofy and innocuous from moment to moment, but taken as a whole reflects something far more emotionally mature. The only gripe I have in this department is Kabu's arc, which, in my opinion, feels sloppy and a little forced. So there is this beast who, some time ago, was the demise of his friends in the wild swamplands. Well, in Chapter 5, you have to face off against the creature once more. And uh, not to brag, but I was pretty much owning this boss. I had all the right stats, all the good medals, and... Wait, wait, what the hell? Well, where did that come from? 
I don't know if it's just me, but this whole thing feels a little contrived, especially with the whole 99 damage and Kabu regaining all of his health back like some Dragon Ball Z character. Foreshadowing is good and the character interactions are great, but this final climactic conflict just feels too on the nose. So the last thing I want to discuss is about how the game handles its lore and world building. Now there are a lot of unique details to this world, <laughs> enough to fill 20 volumes even, literally. But these details are skillfully presented in ways that never feel forced on the player. A great example of this in action are the collectible lore books, which are rewards from quests or are hidden about the world. The tidbits these books tell us are presented as rewards rather than through cutscenes or essays of dialogue the player is forced to endure. This is a great use of game design for storytelling. The game does have its lore dumps from time to time, but they're never too invasive, especially considering the expansiveness of the game's world. Also, I should just mention that some of the lore itself is really clever. Like, there's an explanation of how some of the enemies are bugs just like you, but are not sentient or bipedal. What's more is that the lore serves as part of the story's backbone. Now, this may seem like writing 101, but you'd be surprised at how many games pull story details out of thin air for the sake of gameplay, only to prop them up with semi-believable pseudo-lore later on. I don't care how often the Pokemon franchise tries justifying catching Pokemon as some kind of ancient tradition or necessity for modern society. We've got a great game with great gameplay mechanics. I don't know why we need to take that and turn it into some fate of the world story. The story progression in Bug Fables is organically driven from this rich pool of lore, from the hunt of the everlasting sapling, which spearheads the plot, to the deep history of the different bug species, which shapes your interactions with the characters, to the ancient roach people and their magic crystals, which explain so many of the strange phenomena of this world, but still leave a hint of mystery as to how they work. And that's another thing about this game's lore. The writers leave just enough mystery for the player to keep wondering past the game's conclusion. Like with the continued development of our complex characters, the story and legend of the land persists and feels much larger than what we see in the game. There are mentions of northern kingdoms and exotic lands far to the east, allusions to creatures and characters from the distant past, and even a hopeful glimmer for the future beautification of the sinister dead lands. This hinting at deeper lore and concepts is called the iceberg theory of world building and is partly what makes Bug Fable's story and world so compelling and rich. It's crazy the amount of variety and story you get from games today. Yet, Bug Fables The Everlasting Sapling is like the Goldilocks of storytelling. A lot of characters and dialogue, a lot of story arcs and twists, but just enough to remember comfortably without having to run to a wiki. Again, the influence from Paper Mario games here is unabashedly apparent, and many of the same writing techniques from those games are present here as well. But the writers do so much more with these complex and deeply motivated characters, these intricate bits of lore and well-foreshadowed twists. I really hope that the folks at Moonsprout Games keep at it, developing great games featuring writing on a similar par. And, you know, I think it would be really interesting to see them branch out and tackle something wildly different, like an adventure platformer or survival horror, just to see what can happen. Kudos to the developers for making this amazing game. I can't say enough how much I enjoy playing it. Though, I guess I should move on to playing something else now. You know, I still need to beat the final boss of Bloodborne. I guess I really should get on that, or I can just buy this game again! Thank you.